people are safe to say still good morning or something. Um, I'm Amiro Kirpatsky, I'm going to chair this panel. Um, I want to first start with something that uh, you wouldn't find in the bio uh, or in the program. And uh, I hope you all, us in the Institute and everybody present, would join in congratulating uh, Dr. Indebar uh, for being a new dad. Yes. So, congratulations. And now I'll try to talk that. Um, I'll just present the two speakers very briefly and uh, we launch into the, uh, into the presentation of the shows. Uh, Indebar Ryer, I said it right, uh, presenting today's paper, 1967, Cells, Clusters, and System is an architectural historian and an associate professor in the Azrieli School of Architecture and Urbanism in Carleton University, Ottawa. He holds a PhD and a Master of Architecture from the Columbia University. Um, he explores ways in which architects and bureaucrats have imagined the modern metropolis as producing ideal citizens, citizen risk. So this work has taken several forms, including an extensive look at the Toulouse La Marie, Marie the consequential French Ville Nouvelle built in the 1960s, and more recently, an examination of, ideology, of ideologies of reconstruction in West Germany. Ryer is currently, and pertaining to our subject today, preparing a book forthcoming in 2018 uh, on the intellectual and architectural programs of Expo 67. Um, we're also honored to have here Ina Mar Mar Mari, Ina Mari, presenting today the paper on unfamiliar ground, Habitat 67 as a representation of home and myth. Uh, this is an, she, she is an architectural curator, translator, and historian. Uh, she obtained her Master of Architecture and PhD in History and Theory of Architecture uh, from McGill University. Uh, where she served as head of the Art and Architecture uh, Library, curator of the Canadian Architectural Collection, and chief curator of rare books and special collections. In 2004, she was appointed the Sir Benster Fletcher Director of the British Architectural Library and Collection, the Royal Institute of British Architects. Since 2016, she has been working as an executive director the Kapelski Architectural Center and Foundation in her native Prague. Uh, Irna Mary uh, has edited, authored, and translated numerous books and articles, including Moshe Svadia, Buildings and Project, 1967-1992, that came out at McGill Queen's University Press in 96. And I just clear the podium to you. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm, uh, I'm delighted to be here, of course, inside this modernist jewel of a building um, among old friends and new colleagues. Um, there are many people to thank, but like many others, I will limit my thanks to uh, Jennifer Solomon uh, for her unfaltering assistance, for which I'm very grateful. It is also, for me, a very special privilege to speak alongside Irena Murray, who I knew only by reputation, but remain, like many historians, indebted to her pioneering work on crucial collections at McGill, not least the Moshe Safdie Archive. My aim this morning is to speak in very general terms on certain matters of architectural concern surrounding Expo 67. In fact, you'll have to forgive me, it's not tied specifically to the theme of the day. Uh, there is really no organizing thread to my talk, but there are some rather good images. Um, but I will have a concluding note on Habitat 67, which I hope should uh, segue comfortably to Dr. Burry's talk. Let me begin. For six months in 1967, 50 million people came to see the world represented, reclassified, and remapped. Across two islands and an elongated pier in Montreal St. Lawrence River, 60 nations, many ancient, others only recently born, corporations, new agencies such as the UN and the European community, three religions, the Kindergarten of Vienna, the Indians of Canada, and a host country celebrated its centenary gathered under the aegis of Expo 67. The theme, terrorism, or man and his world, 
a sentiment borrowed from the pre-war aviator philosopher Antoine de Saint-Exupéry, suggested civic kinship, democratic sentiment, technological sophistication, and international cooperation. In a brilliant stroke of marketing, visitors were issued a passport. This, in fact, is my father's passport. As they moved among countries and corporations, a stamp was issued for every pavilion entered, for every frontier crossed. A laissez-passer, allowing, however briefly, a borderless vision of a world free from inequity, strife, and indeed violence. Like so many long-planned and short-lived universal exhibitions, Expo 67 aimed at nothing less than establishing the norms and forms of global modernity. Central to the simultaneously spectacular didactic effort were novel architectural experiments. Extending the optimism of large-scale thinking in the 1960s, sufficiently heroic structures could, it was hoped, make imminent new forms of human interaction, social control, and the technical organization of space. In 1967, architects and others still retained a historical self-consciousness of markedly modernist conviction and long duration. On one hand, an abiding faith in technological salvation, and on the other hand, the sense of some genuine mass culture and political subjectivity giving rise to a new citizen of the world. Put another way, their philosophical ideal had not yet come to derive its critical distance by rejecting encyclopedic understanding and universal, universal self-realization. This held significance for the liberal humanist project or principles underlying Expo 67. Broadly speaking again, World's Fairs extended the Enlightenment project of instrumental reason of public edification. The world in a shilling, the 1951 Great Ex Exhibition had promised. In the past, these ambitions were captured in any number of galeries des machines, vehicles of measuring human self-realization by an awestruck awareness of a world mediated by technology. Yet in the aftermath of global war, of the extermination of human beings, and the looming terror of nuclear Armageddon, the destructive capacity of techno-science gave pause. The splitting of the atom signified both a terrifying power and a thrilling source of energy. One promised total annihilation, the other salvation. On one side stood complete social and psychological alienation as a product of fear from the life world. On the other side grew a total embrace of emerging technologies, communications, mass media, transportation, shaping Pacific visions of internationalism and collective self-awareness. At its most optimistic, this worldview held that nationalisms, including those of recent decolonizing countries, could still be challenged into alternative forms of belonging, free of chauvinism and narrow self-interest. And I was very interested to hear the descriptions of the Pavilion of Israel in this kind of sense. The corresponding architectures were to be technologically sophisticated and mass-produced while, no while engendering novel forms of social interaction. If this indicated, however remotely, an avant-garde undertaking, and I would argue that it did not necessarily, that it reminded just how art, including the building sciences, had, since the late 18th century, served the ongoing construction of a European, American, Anglo-Saxon subject as citizen and as tastemaker, and corresponding notions on transforming the rest of the world. This was not only a matter of technics. It was fundamentally concerned of aesthetics, of outward appearance, of not only symbolizing, but actualizing a whole new social life. The thing was, long before anyone had an inkling of what exactly Expo 67 would look like, the planning authorities had tried to prescribe a preferred form. In late 1964, as nations began considering how to represent themselves, the World's Fair Corporation began promoting cellular construction promising a way forward for architects around the world. Cellular may well have meant modular. Contemporaneous discourses on megastructures, critical to the cellular argument, kept faith with an inheritance of the 19th century, a direct lineage of the 19th century. Namely, that in the endless exercise of modernity and its most consequent architecture, socially transformative experience could only be achieved 
by an ongoing refinement of seemingly lightweight, flexible, and sufficient, sufficiently massive architectural works. In other words, economies of scale uh, through serialized production and assembly. Externally, the impression was of cluster geometries, nested forms, endlessly unfolded and efficient shapes, an expression of maximal points of contact and minimal wasted space between solids, embodying, once again, doctrines of efficiency and the liberating power of instrumental technology. Internally, the biomechanical description implied a world of open structures without any sense of hierarchy or centrality overcome by welcome experiences of dispersal. Directly correlating form and use, the proposed geometries would, in theory, allow democracy, individualism, commodification, and consumption to be balanced freely and without contradiction. Following the Expo 67 theme of Man and His World, these seeming contradictions were, of course, meant to be settled quite naturally. In fact, the contradictions were the consistent juxtapositions of nature and technology, which so long had remained clearly and consistently juxtaposed. All of this kept faith with the powerful post-war project of discovering patterns at both invisible and infinite scales capable of creating psychological and social harmony in the built environment. Influential works such as Georg Kepisch's The New Landscape in Art and Science in 1956, in such works, a, ce a ceaseless stream of images collapsed distinctions between the natural and mechanical realms. Attempts to discover primary signifying forms gave ways to resituate and then to navigate the information overload of the post-war world. The efficiencies of nature were to be envied and emulated, reduced to the cell, literally the building block, as a biological unit. And its aggregation, the repetition of a single unit, suggested not only complex formal solutions, but economies, again, economies of scale, reflecting the complete reorganization of industry, capital, resources, and techno-scientific know-how. One is, of course, reminded of Buckminster Fuller and discourses on space frames that, for many, provide an alternative trajectory of modernism, but with no less prophetic and universalizing mission. To, space, to enthusiasts, space frames, inexpensive to produce, structurally efficient, were an argument against arid functionalism. Theories of minimal material achieving maximal strength aim at providing entirely new aesthetic and spatial experiences, rooted not, I would say, in the plasticity of space, but in the reduction of all things to elemental structure. Hence the lessons of biomorphic images upheld as guides towards design. The ready emphasis on visual evidence connecting the organic and the man and the human made was a self-conscious project of naturalization, of converting process of nature into works of technology and into works of culture. This totalizing project of conjoining the human and the natural and the mechanical lay in the ascent in, lay in ascended discourses, notably systems theory in the post-war human sciences. Systems theory was the application of the principle of biological self-regulation to machines and society. It followed from a very particular view of organicism in biology, which derives out of the 1920s as reshaped in the post-war world. It is an appreciation of wholeness and dynamics, offering a theory of organization applicable to any number of social, economic, or technological questions. What mattered, above all, was the construction of totalities, social systems, economic models, architectural works. Systems which share with cybernetics the embrace of feedback as a way to maintain things in equilibrium, thereby forever increasing performance, offered solutions by endless calculation and measurement. These were attempts to reinscribe a grand humanist project within modernist thought, not one of opposition, but of synthesis. These are quite wonderful photographs of the original designs. These are the maquettes of how many of the pavilions were going to be filled. This is Man the producer, man the explorer, you can see this incredible use of architectural models by the designers in imagining this world of, of, of immersion. The outlook, enormous in its appetites, indicated our architects envisioned themselves as artistic, technocratic elites. They aimed at nothing less than closing the gap between discursive acts and pragmatic ones. 
However naively, architects felt confident that they could collapse divisions between thought and action, thereby advancing nothing less than the world historical project in which architecture, architecture, building sciences, could usher in the stabilization of societies. So how to deal with this? How to deal with this here in arguably the most famous building at Expo 67? Uh, the debate, of course, is out on this side. Partisans will say that uh, Bucky Fuller's geodesic dome is the more famous one. Uh, I won't go into that. When in 1964, the Expo 67 authorities called for selling their construction as a way of the future, they had very little by way of example, except one, the Israeli emigre and McGill graduate Moshe Safdi's Habitat 67, the prototypical housing complex that had, in fact, found its way into the very first Expo 67 master plan of December 1963. Safdie's project resulted from his 1961 McGill thesis. These are his presentation boards as, as a student. Uh, I have to just pause and mention that the guy was a monster. He won every imaginable award as a student. I mean, he had a kind of protean talent. Uh, I, I mean, it was just that uh, he was, I think, older than, than his classmates and, and probably came with an incredible maturity uh, that I'll address in a second. But he was, he was a, a, a quite an unbelievable, uh, unbelievable force. This work, a dense and precocious statement on housing, the, uh, on housing, also marked a deep engagement with modernist orthodoxy and post-war challenges to it. The intellectual origins were remarkably vast. Among the most resonant were Safdie's liberal board borrowings from Dutch structuralism, a movement generally associated with a charismatic Amsterdam architect, Aldo Van Eyck, uh, an incredible architect, I would argue. Uh, in fact, he was a he was a, uh, a Dutch Jew who mercifully uh, avoided the war uh, by seeking refuge in Switzerland and came back to Holland and, and really was at the forefront of this movement we generally call Dutch structuralism. Architectural structuralism has emerged in the 1960s, saw the discovery of elementary signifying forms that, based on their additive use, would situate simultaneously the space of the individual um, and the greater extents of the social realm. The structuralist hallmark of repeating, often prefabricated modular cells was a conscious projection of informal arrangements implying a purposeful breakdown of architectural order into more culturally accessible forms. Van Eyck had in 1959 called for designing what he called towards an organized casbah. With a particular aesthetic and technological bias, let me see if I have this here. With a particular aesthetic and ethnological bias, Van Eyck saw non-Western architectures as harboring truer principles of architecture form. It's very interesting to note here the degree to which Israel would be posited as Western or non-Western in this discourse in terms of architectural culture and ancient traditions to be emulated. The, the jury would be very much out on this, and, and Iran Neumann, uh, a friend and colleague, will speak tomorrow uh, evening, will we'll very much be able to address this. Guided by anthropological fieldwork as a means of gathering architectural knowledge, Van Eyck steadfastly believed in discovering some underlying system of order in cultural and spatial phenomena. While sharing Van Eyck's search for recognizable units expressing change and growth, the young Safdie distanced himself from the Dutch architect's anti-positivism by adopting instead a more instrumental approach to technology. Later, when insisting that Aegean hill villages, Arab hill towns, or Indian pueblos were true building systems, these are Safdie's words, given their consistent vocabulary of repetitive components, Safdie positioned habitat in the grand tradition of spontaneous self-made environments because he said its vernacular, this is a word he uses, its vernacular was not a dome or an adobe roof, but the standardized units themselves. It's crucial to note that in all of this, Safdie's argument was leveled against this incredibly famous building, Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation of 1952. Safdie was in a way haunted by this building. He would repeatedly sketch it in books as a student and write notes as an argument against it. This building, a social condenser, was an argument for balancing the individual in the individual and the collective. And Safdie's argument against it was that the social life was congealed inside. He wanted to distribute outward this kind of form 
as a truer, in a way, balance between the familial and the social unit, he also wanted to make a bend to the norms of North American private property. Curiously, though, the kind of fraternal order that Corbusier imagined arising spontaneously in the Unite was, in fact, well known to Safdie. Soon after Expo 67 closed, in an interview in 1968, a remarkable interview uh, that is in the archive, he would recall his deep debt to the kibbutz system in which he had been raised, first in Palestine and then in Israel. He would call it an open-ended, civilized, much more humane interpretation of Marxism. The Fourierist sympathy that had generated the unite also lay at the heart of the kibbutz systems. But if anything, the kibbutz, as a social body, represented a theory of labor, one largely predicated on cooperative ownership of the means of production, often rooted in anarcho-cooperative or communitarian ideals. Safdie's approach to work was something completely different. He had a profound disdain for the North American labor force, and his argument against it would be the mass systemization of construction. It's, it's a very deep tension in his kind of crypto-utopian ideals. Hence, these kinds of publicity photographs, which Safdie very judiciously would crop. He would do this over and over again. They would go into mass circulation, in which he would remove the second crane for the construction of habitat. An argument that he would say, in a way, proved through visual propaganda that it was almost an effortless, seamless form of construction. He wanted to fight against what he called waste, efficiency, and idle men. The latter-day Taylorism, harnessing surfeits of unproductive, unpredict, unpredict, unproductivity, underlay the grand paradigm of a nascent leisure society in the 1960s. And these are my just uh, concluding remarks. The ultimate systems would, many had hoped, become societies geared towards automatic perfection. And here, Safdie would be invited as early as 1966 to undertake a program called Operation Breakthrough by the United States government for the mass industrialization of housing, of low cost housing, we should add. It was this conceit that marked the end of the Habitat 67 dream, indeed, of the Expo 67 ambition to pacify man and his world. It would, at first, be writ large in a scheme by the United States government, as I just mentioned to build many, many more habitats as a way of housing populations, its own population. It would also end in fit, fitful attempts at adapting the very same large-scale technology in a place utterly lacking the productive capital here in Puerto Rico. One is, thus left, one is thus left to wonder whether it is perhaps both a shame and a poetic justice that the final resting place of the habitat experiment could only finally have been here, deep in the jungles of the New World. Thank you very much.